In this lesson, we're going to give a basic overview of the structure of solids and the major factors that influence solid properties like melting point. So solids are a little more complex than liquids. They are made up of close packed particles like liquids. However, unlike liquids, the particles don't flow past each other. They're in relatively fixed positions. Solids come in a wider variety of forms, but ultimately we can categorize them into two major classes, crystalline or amorphous. The difference between the two relates to the order of the particles. In crystalline solids, the particles are ordered in a regular repeating pattern. And there are a wide variety of different patterns possible depending upon the type of particles involved. And this is what results in so many different types of crystals. In contrast, for amorphous solids, the particles are not organized in a regular repeating pattern. And the solid on the larger scale doesn't show a regular shape either. Glass and plastic are great examples of amorphous solids. Here you see drawings of a crystalline form of silicon dioxide on the left and an amorphous form on the right. The regular repeating structure of the crystalline form influences the shape of the crystal on the large scale. And this is a picture of the quartz crystal. This is what that regular repeating pattern actually results in on the macroscopic scale. The amorphous form, though, does not form crystals. Instead, we have glass and irregular solid shapes like these silica beads. So solids can also be classified as ionic, network covalent, metallic, or molecular. The differences between these categories depend on the type of particles in the solid and the forces holding them in place. So let's start by looking at ionic solids. Here's a drawing of the composition of sodium chloride at the particle level. The individual particles are composed of oppositely charged ions of sodium in purple and chlorine in green. They're held in a crystal lattice by ionic bonds. And ionic bonds are very strong chemical bonds. This means it takes a lot of energy to disrupt the crystal structure and get the ions to flow past each other. As a result, the melting points of all ionic solids are very high. For example, the melting point of sodium chloride is 800 degrees Celsius. Ionic substances don't easily form gases either. In order to get ions into gaseous state, you need the very high temperatures found in plasma, which are typically thousands of degrees Celsius. Network covalent solids are made up of neutral atoms that are covalently bonded together into a large network. Examples include things like diamonds and silicon dioxide, which makes up quartz and glass. The minerals found in rocks are often network covalent solids. So the covalent bonds extend throughout the solid. These aren't individual molecules, but really large networks of covalently bonded atoms. And we can characterize them by individually repeating units like we do in ionic crystals. So here we see the individual repeating unit for diamond, which is made up of all carbon atoms. And here is the unit for silicon dioxide, which is silicon and oxygen atoms. Below, you see a section of the larger network of these units with covalent bonds extending throughout to make up the solid as a whole. And because these atoms are held in place by strong chemical bonds again, the melting points of these types of solids are very high. Diamonds, for example, have melting points of 4,000 degrees Celsius while quartz melts at temperatures over 1600 degrees Celsius.
So metallic solids are also made up of individual atoms. The forces that hold metal atoms together, though, are metallic bonds. And metallic bonds are a little different than ionic or covalent bonds. Instead of electrons being shared or transferred between two individual atoms, in metallic bonds, electrons are shared across the entire solid. We say they are delocalized into a sea of mobile electrons that move freely between all the atoms. So in this drawing, we see the individual positive charge of the different metal atoms surrounded by a sea of mobile electrons. And these delocalized electrons don't form as strong of bonds as we see for ionic or covalent bond. As a result, the metallic solids can have some pretty low melting points, like mercury, which melts at negative 39 degrees Celsius. The metal atoms aren't held in place as rigidly with metallic bonding either. So as a result, metallic solids can be forced into different shapes. And this is why metals are ductile and malleable. The delocalized electrons associated with metallic bonding flow as well. And this is the reason that metals can conduct electricity well. The last type of solid is a molecular solid. So these are distinctly different than the network solids. The particles in this type of solid are not considered individual atoms, but molecules. And the molecules are held in place by intermolecular forces. And as you know, intermolecular forces are much weaker than actual chemical bonds. As a result, these solids tend to have much lower melting points. Dry ice, which is made up of carbon dioxide, regular ice, made up of water molecules, of course, and iodine are all examples of molecular solids. It's important to note that these substances do contain co covalent bonds, but unlike the network covalent solids, the covalent bonds are not broken during a phase change. The molecules themselves stay intact, it's just the intermolecular forces that must be overcome so that the molecules can move farther apart. In summary, solids can be classified as crystalline or amorphous, depending on the pattern of the particles making them up. Solids can also be classified as ionic, network covalent, metallic or molecular based on the type of particles in the solid and the forces holding them in place.